Okay, we are live. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to this.javascript's State of Web Assembly. Very excited to have a few awesome people here, but I wanted to first and foremost go ahead and introduce um, one of your hosts, Jay Phelps. So, Jay, I'll let you go ahead and take it from here. Hey, everyone, and uh, good morning for many of you. Good afternoon for the others. And uh, so today we're going to be talking in this episode of this.javascript, we're going to talk about WebAssembly and get the, the state of WebAssembly directly from the browser vendors themselves. And joining us, we have uh, Brad Nelson on the far left from representing Chrome, as well as DeepT as well, representing Chrome. Did you remind me of your last name? Uh, Gandhuri. Gandhuri. Okay, cool. Welcome, both of you. Um, we have Luke Wagner, who's representing Mozilla Firefox. Welcome, Luke. And we have Michael Holman, who is representing Microsoft Edge. Welcome, Michael. Hey. So to kick things off, uh, in case anyone listening or watching has not yet really entirely from, um, familiar with what WebAssembly is, let's kind of just organically discuss briefly what WebAssembly actually is, just so they, they get a, a real clear picture. Um, you know, like the description always says that it's a, the, a, um, a, a efficient, low-level bytecode for the web. Um, and I kind of wanted to, to hear from you guys, actually, what, what you guys think that that actually means. Like, uh, so let's start with, um, with uh, let's do Michael, actually. Michael, what, what, do you, what do you think that that means to you? Not to put you on the spot, okay. but to put sure. you on the spot. <laughs> uh, yeah, so to me, uh, it means that you get fast downloads, small binaries, uh, and fast startup is really important as well. Where like before WebAssembly, we had something analogous like ASM.js, which you know you can compile whatever you want to JavaScript and it'll run, but it's giant. And uh, so WebAssembly will get you something uh, a lot more compact and uh, hopefully faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How how would you say like so? There's been a lot of efforts. When I say you, I mean the collective you, all of you. Um, how it, there's been a lot of efforts with um, previous attempts at this, like I guess you could say full starts. Um, there's the, the, the portable knuckle stuff um, from the Chrome side. In fact, let, let's touch on that a little bit. Um, uh, Deep T or Brad, do you want to talk a little bit about what Chrome has done in the past to try and solve this problem? Yeah, so I mean, the native code is, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to uh, mention that uh, you said some of these are false starts, but I don't necessarily think of them that way. It's, uh, we just, you know, these are things that we work on and then, you know, we take useful useful aspects of that technology to build something new. And um, they're more, you know, building on top of each other versus a false start because I can see a lot of NACL that we use. I mean, I think we want to aspire to a lot of what we had working in terms of NACL with Wasm and uh, Asm.js is obviously awesome and we're able to combine this in a way that makes sense. Um, you know, very bad. I didn't mean to correct you. No, that's you. That's, you made a wonderful point, DT. And then, like, I guess what I what I meant by that was just ultimately that the it would have been great if the collective community rallied around it, but they didn't. Um, and that's ultimately all I really meant by that. But you're right; it was a tremendous learning experience, and it empowered you know people to be able to create really awesome plugins. So uh, you know, for what it was, it it worked really well. I, I think I think some of this came down to timing. I mean, I think that there's um, it's uh, you know. Practically the entire time I've been at Google, uh, we've been excited about uh, bringing native applications to the web. And uh, you know, finding a, a way to do that in the standards process is, is great. That's actually uh, you know, ultimately we really want something that works uh, on the whole web and not just in Chrome. So uh, there, were, there were things that we tried to push early on. Uh, it this may be a little, little known thing, but uh, native client actually uh, had its first release uh, as a Firefox plugin. <laughs> yeah, this is part of the process. So, in in, in uh, from Firefox perspective, yeah, you guys led the charge on the Asm.js. Um, what what can you give us the scoop on on that on what Asm.js was? Yeah, uh, it is, I guess, still is. Yeah, it it does it still exist. Awesome hack ever. <laughs> <laughs> that that yeah, <laughs> in some ways. Um, I mean, I guess the story there was just incremental evolution. Is you know we we have this big VM. It has all these 
powerful APIs. We even have this beefy compiler backend that basically is a C compiler backend, but all that C compiler code has to come funnel through JavaScript. So the question was, you know, without having to standardize anything, is, is it possible? What, what's the limit? What's the upper bound of what we can do with JS? Um, bound only by the rules of the language. And so that, that was, that was Asm, AsmJS and it, it worked way better than expected. Um, we didn't really, when we started, we didn't even know what would, uh, what would happen, what performance we were able to get to. And when it basically worked and we were able to like, you know, port huge game engines in a week, um, various people were like, okay, great, ship it. We're like, oh, really? Okay, let's do this thing. Um, Leroy Jenkins, and then uh, and then that's, you know, built and built. And so to me, you know, WebAssembly feels like kind of the, the, the next evolutionary step that was informed by, you know, a bunch of years of seeing what, what worked, what were the pain points with Asm.js, um, and building on a huge compiler infrastructure that that targeted Asm.js and therefore could just transition over, you know, really easily to uh, to WebAssembly. So we saw these problems that were not that were remaining with Asm.js, and we just were able to nail them all with uh, with WebAssembly and build something that ultimately runs in the same VM. It's, it runs on the same web platform, uses the same APIs, it's able to integrate tightly with JavaScript. So as well, I'm sure talk about a lot more in the in the rest of the hour. Uh, uh, be able to you know fit into existing web apps and, and enhance them rather than replacing them or anything. All right. I, think, I think that was one of the, one of the, uh, the challenges with how, how things transpired with, uh, with Knackle and uh, with the Pepper APIs is that it was sort of a, uh, this whole separate set of APIs and a whole separate uh, way of plugging into that platform. And one, one of the great things about uh, the, the WASM path has been that we've been able to uh, more directly interoperate with JS. We, we went through many iterations with, uh, with Knackle in, in that space, but I think uh, you know being able to reuse that API surface scopes down the problem. It's let us uh, uh, not have to sort of uh, boil the ocean, as it were. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And uh, Microsoft Edge, from 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 your perspective, I, I know Edge is relatively to the whole Asm JS thing, and and the Knackle stuff is fairly new to the game. Um, right. So I, I was really excited to hear that you know like. Edge has basically reinvented themselves when it comes from like you know Microsoft being a browser, and um, them being on board from the very beginning was just huge. And I and I and um, so I applaud you for you and your team, the collective you, uh, for for doing that. Uh, I do wanted to point out everyone that uh, there is a, a live chat. So if you have questions for us, uh, feel free to post them in there, and we'll get to them when, when we can. Um, so uh, is there anything, before I continue, is there anything else anyone wants to uh, jump in and, and uh, touch on? Cool. Uh, so I, I kind of wanted to demystify a couple things for people as far as like when you should be using WebAssembly, when you shouldn't, and kind of get um, your, all, your all take on that, uh, that age old question. Like uh, a lot of people are going to ask, at least I'm sure you guys get asked the same questions um, is like things like, is this going to replace JavaScript? Is, am I going to compile my JavaScript to WebAssembly? And you know, if not, why, why not? Um, does anyone want to want to start and uh, touch on that? I can, if you, if you don't want to, I don't, <laughs> I'd rather hear it from you. Um. I guess I, I, I can I can take that. I think that there's a there's a spectrum of, of cases. I mean the the, the web pro platform uh, works uh, really well in all sorts of ways uh, as it is. I think that where WebAssembly uh, has a has a really strong niche right now is uh, if you have uh, either code that you're uh, you're bringing uh, from some language other than JavaScript. Uh, now there's some opportunities to uh, to bring that uh, to the platform. Um, I think there are also cases where uh, where the performance of JavaScript is uh, is limited by the assumptions in the language, and so uh, code that is uh, particularly low level or particularly performance sensitive. If you're you know, worried about uh, when when the GC is going to pause your code, uh, that's a that's a really good time uh, uh, to uh, to consider WebAssembly. I think um, we're starting to see uh, people use WebAssembly in a, in a more nuanced way with uh, you know, individual components of their application. Uh, being used for, for pieces of WebAssembly, so we'll probably see more of that. And then uh, folks that are you know, bringing over whole uh, sort of, uh, language runtimes, uh, like what the, uh, the Blazor folks are, are doing, that's a, that's a case where you, you know, wouldn't be able to uh, sort of do that piecemeal. So, um, in terms of compiling uh, uh, to uh, JavaScript to WebAssembly, right now, 
uh, it's, it's not the best target for that. Um, there are some you know, features coming that might make that possible. I think that uh, it'll be pretty challenging to uh, match the level of performance uh, you know, targeting uh, um, that the engines are able to do directly because we're obviously running one layer below uh, everything else. And so being able to, uh, to match that will be, be a challenge. I imagine at the point, especially that we have uh, features just like managed objects, there might be folks that will try that. Um, you, could, you could imagine doing it now, uh, but uh, it would uh, obviously have uh, uh, not the performance that we'd be looking for. Mm -hmm. And there, there are some, there, uh, there's in fact the, the creator of assembly script, um, which is a, a, a language designed specifically to compile the web assembly with a TypeScript like syntax. Um, he's actually joined uh, in the chat, and so if you have questions for him, if anyone has questions for him, they can reach out to him. But yeah, like I, when I talk, talk to people about it, it's basically the same thing I say, is that like right now at least, you know, that's that plan is not to kill JavaScript or have JavaScript compile to WebAssembly and all that stuff. Um, but that doesn't mean, that's just because JavaScript itself is such a dynamic language. That doesn't mean you can't make some language that, you know, aesthetically looks like JavaScript, but has less dynamic syntax. And semantics. What is uh, have 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 you all played with any of those um, like assembly script, turbo script, um, or just just seen them in passing? Definitely looked at some of them. One I think big thing that kind of is a, just a just a general issue with you know WASM has linear memory, not GC memory. So when you allocate memory, you have to give it back, and that's something that's you know if you're not used to doing that, it's a pretty foreign thing to do, and it's also really hard to do. It's, you know, there's an entire world of static mm -hmm. type system stuff that's, you know, C++ idioms built into the Rust language of how does one not forget to leak or, or, or the opposite of free too eagerly. So, um, so, so that's something where I think it's pretty foreign. It'll be pretty foreign for people to adopt until we get the managed objects, until we get the GC integration. Mm -hmm. That's when I think will really open the floodgates for a lot of different source languages to compile to WebAssembly and give people a good experience. Does anyone know how the the current like the Blazor stuff like the languages that used garbage collection? How are they currently? Are they shipping their own GC? Are they using ref counting? Yeah, exactly. They they are they are. Um, my understanding from the uh, actually Michael, you can speak this, but but the uh, mo the mono folks are actually uh, they're even simplifying the problem further. They're they're uh, waiting until they're uh, they're actually at a frame uh, boundary before they do a GC. That simplifies. Dealing with the uh, uh, the uh, hidden hidden values in the WebAssembly stack, um, but in general, yeah, they're shipping their own GC. There's you know pros and cons to that. Uh, it obviously gives them more flexibility. Um, but uh, managed objects will, will, for many languages, make that easier. There are some languages where uh, what we're likely to be able to offer with the managed objects proposal may not be a perfect fit. But um, we'll have to see how that evolves. It also helps that they're a monolithic application. They were uh, Doing uh, doing C sharp sort of intimately interacting with JavaScript, so mm -hmm. they have interesting uh, uh, cycle problems uh, in terms of memory management. Mm -hmm. I, I did I did want to point out the the one one interesting thing about this uh, this sort of trade off between managing your own memory. Uh, there are certainly cases where uh, where the where uh, not having the GC in the mix is, is actually great. Like if you're dealing with audio, you really don't want a GC pause in the middle of that, and so. Having the option to man manually manage memory is actually yeah, it's definitely a superpower. But I guess with great power comes great responsibility. Spider Man. <laughs> yep. It's funny. I feel like every time I talk about WebAssembly, I end up saying that at one point as well. Like the whole Spider Man <laughs> quote. <laughs> it feels right. Yeah. It feels right. Uh, so just a reminder for anyone joining us, you're welcome to ask us, shoot us your questions. And in fact, I'm going to start. I know there were some questions on Twitter. Let me pull those up here real quick. Give me a moment. So we have one question, let's see, by uh, Alexander. Um, I'm not sure if that, I think that's a pseudo name. Uh, I have several questions, actually. Are any improvements in interop between JavaScript and Wasm? Are, are, I assume that's, are there any improvements? And uh, currently is quite slow. So I think they're talking about the, the foreign function interface. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in, in general, I guess across, because that's going to that's gonna probably differ drastically depending on the browser vendor. Um, anyone have any updates on, on, on that front? 
Um, so, actually, yeah, uh, I was going to talk some of that, at least uh, talk about some of that in uh, the Chrome update. We've got a few things uh, with, you know, the any ref proposal and um, the weak ref shipping in, uh, I'm sorry, moving to stage two in TC39 that makes this finding a little simpler. And um, I, I think that it's just it's a long, far away place to get to to make it interrupt really well. But I think we're making, you know, bits of progress on getting there. Cool. Yeah. Uh, on the topic of the speed of calling in and out of Wasm, uh, as part of, you know, front loading part of the, our browser update was we've uh, recently, uh, there's some paths previously calling in or out of Wasm, where in some cases you would go the slowest possible way. You would call it C++, do the general case to jump back in. And so finally now we've, we've flushed out all of those. So all paths now into and out of Wasm should stay in JIT code and uh, be a hair slower than a non inlined JavaScript to JavaScript call, which is 10 or 20 times faster than it was in some cases before. So that was a known pain point before, and we finally got around, at least in Firefox, to fixing our problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that boundary is definitely something something we care about. And there's um, certainly it's, it's, more, it's a more expensive uh, uh, boundary uh, uh, in Chrome currently than, than we'd like. Um, as as Deepthi said, I think. Um, some of the work around uh, uh, host bindings and, and, uh, and uh, reference types will uh, open up the door to, to making that a really nice boundary, um, uh, both in terms of the ergonomics of it, but also you know, opening up uh, some, some performance optimization opportunities. But uh, definitely something we should, we should look at as well uh, as the, that boundary is uh, unusually expensive. Any updates? And on the edge side as well, uh... Yeah, we, we have calls from JavaScript to WebAssembly are still pretty slow. We have to go through a C++ thunk, like uh, Luke was saying, where we do all our boxing. But uh, it is something that you know we're planning on improving. Uh, and calls from WebAssembly out to JavaScript right now are pretty fast. They they don't have to do any extra work other than just uh, you know tagging in and things like that. Cool. Uh, the next question from the same person is, is, uh, is expected some new approaches to receiving structures, complex, ob complex objects from WebAssembly function. Currently, it's quite difficult to do. You need to, you need to call get index in memory and get length of the structure. So it sounds like it, they're, they're possibly talking about um, you know, passing interop basically between JavaScript and WebAssembly. Like if you've got a string being the easiest example, you know, like I've got a string in C, or and I want to you know send that to JavaScript. Um, any any thoughts on on those sorts of interrupts? I think it's probably going to go hand in hand with the manage object stuff. Yeah, I think I think short short term we may be able to get there some of that nicer in, with uh, where we go with host bindings. That'll be a place where we can where the strings in particular will likely do something uh, uh, that'll make like that nicer. I think that uh, the the general ergonomics, you know, as Deepu mentioned, weak weak refs moving forward will be uh, it'll be nice to not have to uh, worry about who manages the memory. That'll give a, a finalization signal uh, across that boundary. Um, the uh, one we've taught, at least on our side with the uh, uh, a bunch of the web GPU folks, we've they've been very concerned about. Um, how uh, how that API how whether that API will be sort of filled with property bags uh, and whether or not that will be sufficiently uh, fast uh, when interacting with WebAssembly. And so they're eager to, uh, to to make sure that whatever we end up doing uh, on that boundary will be nice. As a one particular example, uh, the AnyRef proposal, which sounds like multiple of us are starting to prototype, implement. Um, will allow just directly passing a string into WASM and just not even copying necessarily into linear memory. And so depending on what language it is, how it binds, how you're binding to the language, because that's that's a separate story, mm -hmm. um, this could allow it to just be like no worse than J JavaScript. You just pass it through the boundary and it just it's just like an int, you know, in a sense. Yeah, and uh, I mean the state is. So, so are you all started on that? We we've 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 got CLs in flight to. Oh yeah. That's right. Got so. patches for up for review. <laughs> yeah. Exciting. Wonderful. We actually, Jay, we have a part of two awesome people. Thanks everyone for joining. 
um, on the live chat. So Daniel has joined us from the Blazer team. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Daniel, we'd love to obviously have you on sometime to talk about this as well. Um, Jake had some questions about uh, laws and support. And Deborah, of course, brought up um, Blazer in general. It's definitely a really big thing. Uh, and really big, uh, excited about this from Microsoft. I don't know if you want to talk about that. and also answer Jake's question about uh, Active-based languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that, I think that's what that's what Jake asked, right? It says, uh, "Can can Wasm support actor-based languages like Erlang?" Mm -hmm. Anyone want to touch on that? I don't think there's any, I haven't seen any actual like experiments to do so. Well, in some sense, there's a very much a yes. It's a, it's a general <laughs> low level <laughs> compilation target. So you can compile a lot of stuff to it. Sometimes the question is more like subtle performance characteristics. Like does Erlang assume tons and tons of threads? At the moment, the web has workers. They're kind of expensive and it's hard to have tons and tons of them. So yeah. when it, it comes down to sometimes performance characteristics of can it support it? Absolutely, yes. It's during complete target, but but can it support it in the way that it is in the in the in its uh, as just as well as it is natively? That's that's the harder question that takes studying what the current VMs for Erlang do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that that may be something where where you know yeah, you know if we had uh, um, some of some of the ideas that have been talked about with stack switching or delimiter right. operations, then then it would obviously be easier to do a really great job uh, in that space. I imagine that. Uh, compared to what you could do on top of JS, probably we're doing better than we were, but you know, maybe, maybe not. Depends on the A really great. Mm -hmm. So we've got um, another question from Twitter. Are there any movements? Actually, actually, I did want to, have, want to say one other thing on that one. Um, I think that, that that is sort of in the broad one of the things that we we should be on the lookout for. I mean, I think that. Uh, Enabling uh, a broader swath of languages to run well is, is something we aspire to, and I don't. Well, well, certainly for you know, uh, there are particular features that tend to be the sort of hot spot for individual languages. I think that in the limit, there are there are a finite number of those things. There are you know, the machine has things to get at, the machine has things to get at. If we can expose the the, uh, the things that uh, the machine is fundamentally efficient at, um, then, then I think we. We'll sort of enable that if we're going to All right. Cool. So we've got another question on Twitter. Are there any movements in debugging and source map specs? So support for source maps and improvement in the debugging space of WebAssembly. Um, so so uh, source map support in, in Chrome will be coming real soon now. Uh, it's uh, in, in progress uh, right now. Uh, source maps works a little bit better than Firefox. Um, yeah, we have some source maps. You can put breakpoints in your in your C code and stop there. Inspecting the local state is a different story. <laughs> now that requires, I believe, what is has been around for a while as an extension to source maps, where you describe this scope has these variables and it maps to this underlying. And this was useful even for compiled JavaScript because sometimes scopes get scrambled in the compilation process. So first we wanted to extend source maps to allow this for JavaScript and then WebAssembly could hook into that, which has been some of the magic of source maps is that if you squint your eyes right, line numbers can look like bytecode offsets and then you know mostly source maps can apply to WebAssembly. Um, so, so we're working on that extension so you can actually like look at local variables and have some maybe hopefully mean something um, in your program. But we're still working. There's a number of rough spots there that I think still need polish. And I think in the limit for debugging, um, there's there's going to be more that will need to happen. I think we'll, we'll need you know uh, either to uh, either to to more intimately expose. Uh, uh, the state of the VM, so that we can we can offer some kind of an imperative uh, debugging protocol. Uh, for some languages, it, it it will be insufficient to represent things just in the source map. I suspect in the limit will we'll need something uh, either sitting there, uh, you know, sort of uh, man in the middling the uh, the debugging protocol. You know, if you've got a uh, a language runtime, say for Python, you're going to want to be able to talk down into the core of that and. Lots, lots more to do for, for really great debugging in the limit. I think for, for C++, we can, there's some things we can do to get it better soon. Agreed, yeah. 
I don't actually know for, for Rust how, how, how well the debugging experience maps currently. I think uh, Rust produces or is in the process of producing Dwarf. And then Yuri is working on generating source maps from Dwarf. Yes. And so that'll, uh, I think, complete the, the path. Cool. And uh, somewhat related to that, uh, uh, John uh, asked a question about uh, being able to step through JavaScript into WebAssembly and, and vice versa. Yeah, that one works today, at least in Firefox. What If you don't have a source map, when you step in, you'll, you'll just be seeing JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you're at a, the, the cursors within the WATs that we've generated from the binary. And you, you can step through that. You can even inspect the locals of the WASM locals. And then when you and when you look at the call stack, you'll see JS, JS, WASM, and you can click up and down. And uh, it's, it's uh, yeah. Kind yeah, of the, the debugging experience in general has been something that uh, has been a great benefit from um, from being on the main, uh, being on, on the JavaScript thread as well. Uh, certainly for, for some folks that have made the transition from native client to uh, WebAssembly, they've even highlighted that as it's like, oh, it's nice to, to not have to be, for, web, for native client, you were effectively always off on a, uh, something like a worker, you were communicating over post message. So being able to have that stack trace that has the combination of both is nice. Uh, right on. So just so we don't, uh, just I'm sure there will be a lot more questions. And just so we don't duplicate, because we've already answered some of those, uh, does, do we want to start doing our, our quick browser vendor updates? So we'll, we can, uh, let's start with uh, Microsoft Edge with Michael. Uh, sure. So uh, we just released uh, WebAssembly support on by default in the uh, fall creators update. And so now it should be in all the browsers enabled. Uh, and we also released uh, cross-plat support in Shocker Core 1.8 in January. And so like, you know, it should be everywhere in Shocker right now. Uh, right now we're kind of working on like threads and SIMD support. Unfortunately, threads got uh, got beaten up a little bit because of uh, Spectre. And so it's unclear when when that will really get enabled. Hopefully, uh, you know, either our mitigations will be sufficient and we can enable it, or Intel will come out with new hardware that uh, <laughs> makes everything better. I'm not, I'm not so sure about the second one yet, but I can hope. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we're also working on like adding multiple return values, which is a cool feature, I think. Uh, oh, I'm glad to hear you, you all started on that. That's a that's yeah, a yeah. I think it's a it's a cool one. Even though I don't know when toolchain support will come for it, you know, I kind of like. It. Uh, and then on top of that, we're doing uh, kind of some perf improvements. Uh, we just added like inlining support in the creators update as well, and uh, we're doing you know some more just general uh, improving our code gen kind of things. And uh, so I know that like a lot of WebAssembly games and things want uh, WebGL support. So we're, we're trying to push to improve our support there as well, because it's, it's uh, especially WebGL2 support is like you know, not there yet on Edge. But uh, we're, we're pushing forward to try to get that in. As we can. Um, that's where we are. Uh, I think one of the interesting things about uh, Edge's strategy is we kind of do something a little bit different than the other browsers, uh, where we don't we don't ahead of time compile our WASM, and for different scenarios, it it kind of has uh, some different effects where we can get like a starter fast uh, faster startup and uh, lower memory usage because we don't compile all the functions, um, but. The, the downside to it is that you might not get a stable FPS. So if you're on uh, games, it, it might be that you'd want it to be ahead of time compiled. Or if you're doing something like a .NET application, maybe that doesn't matter as much where you just want you know the button that you're clicking to be clicked as, as soon as possible. Uh, and so right now, we haven't really seen any FPS issues, but uh, it's something that you know, we're we're keeping an eye on to make sure that like uh, we're not sacrificing game performance uh, with the strategy. But it, it works very well for JavaScript, and so so far we've we've thought it uh, it's worked well for WebAssembly. So 
Yep. Um, and I think that's that's really uh, that's about it for me. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Uh, does anyone else want to touch on? There was a question in the chat about uh, about uh, the JIT. Um, do do the engines JIT their WebAssembly to x86 or whatever you know CPU that it's on? And if it if it's uh, and is it based on LLVM? If you do do the jitting, real quick, does anyone want to to touch on that for their for their browser vendor? Well, they're saying JIT. Maybe it's a Michael question. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, we we don't jit using LLVM. We have, uh, I mean, our own kind of backend, which is I assume the same for everybody except Apple had some LLVM stuff at some point. For a while. I think they pulled that out, but yeah, yeah. But they they might have pulled it out now. But so everybody kind of has their own backends. It's, it's funny uh, that uh, the JF's not here, so we can beat him up. <laughs> That's the, right. The rep for Apple, unfortunately, wasn't able to join us. So. Yeah, though, to reduce confusion, I mean, there is an LLVM-based tool chain that, that is used by everyone that's taking C++ over to, to WebAssembly. So that, but that happens ahead of time before you're in the browser, once you're in the browser. Yeah, I believe we're all going down to native machine code. Yeah. And V8, does V8 do a similar thing to what it does with Turbofan and Ignition with the like interpreting first and then moving um, to jitting, or so is it all current, ahead of currently time? Currently, we actually go straight to our, our highest tier. We are in the process of bringing up a, a baseline compiler that will uh, still go to machine code, but will uh, do sort of a faster pass over, over the machine code uh, uh, and then tier up to, to the faster tier. Um, the, uh, we do have an interpreter tier that, that kicks in when you're debugging, uh, but that's that's not something you would hit unless you have dev tools open. Um, and, and in general, that's that's been one of the nice one of the nice properties that WebAssembly has versus versus JS is that you generally uh, sort of tear up, but you generally don't have to tear down uh, in the way that you frequently do with JavaScript. Uh, but right now we're doing that steep cliff, and that's why our compilation time is uh, is not uh, not all that we would like it to be. Makes sense. Let's get to that highest tier. Uh, Luke, do you want to give us your the update uh, from Mozilla Firefox? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so at a high level, we work on optimizations, uh, kind of a squeaky new clean uh, Rust WASM tool chain, and new post MVP WASM features. So in the optimization area, uh, I already mentioned you know fast calls in and out of WebAssembly for kind of all the cases, so you get to stay in JIT code. Um, also, a lot of work around improving load time. So at the moment, we've finally, like in the last release, enabled our streaming parallel <laughs> tiering compiler. So streaming means um, when you use the, the compilation API that takes a response object, response that comes from a fetch, response holds a stream. So as soon as the first bytes come over the wire, we can start compiling which means we can use that time while it's down, the bytes are downloading to time when you're waiting to run anyways to, to compile code. And parallel means those bytes are being dispatched function by function to a ton of worker threads. So you can use all your free cores to, uh, to compile this stuff to machine code. And the tiering means that we uh, made a first tier compiler. And unlike the, you know, the top tier compiler, which builds a whole compiler graph and optimizes it kind of like a classic C compiler, the, the, the first tier compiler basically says, what can I do in a single loop over the bytecode? So it's you know looping over the bytecode and spitting out machine code and doing only the optimizations it can do in a single linear pass without too much work. And this gives us a compiler that compiles WASM like 10 to 15 times faster than our top tier compiler, but produces code that's less than two times slower. So it's like a pretty, pretty good trade-off. And when you put all these things together, we can basically, we've observed even on mobile compile WASM have ready to run machine code faster than the network can deliver it. So by the time you're done downloading, we're ready to run with pretty fast machine code that would probably beat like, you know, the equivalent JavaScript machine code given that WASM two times slower than top tier performance tends to still be faster than JS. Um, so so and overall really, you know, big kind of load time improvements. And Lynn wrote a really great article full of awesome cartoons on uh, hacks, if you search for like WebAssembly and hacks. Um, in the Rust to WASM toolchain space, uh, previously there was a compiler that was built on mscripten. So kind of porting Rust to the web kind of felt like generally porting a C++ app. But the, all the new work that the Rust community had done is about trying to make it feel more like you're actually writing 
web code. So writing Rust code feels like you're writing an ES module, except the language is Rust, not JavaScript. So there are imports and exports, and that's how you talk to the world. And ultimately, it produces modules that you can import and export from other JavaScript. And so there's a lot of great work on this. In uh, if you want to look at it and, or join into uh, it's and the uh, Rust WASM GitHub repo. And part of that work is they're trying to make a book or like collaboratively writing a book about all this. So, you you know, ultimately, you know, Rust to was Rust web development won't be uh, like an arcane art or anything. It'll just be uh, hopefully just a normal thing you might want to do for some of your modules that are hot. And so there's some cool initial use cases of like uh, Nick rewrote the core algorithm of source maps of a, of a common source maps package to to Rust and got, you know, big speed ups. Um, and the last category is new features. Uh, like Michael was saying, we're working hard on threads, being able to like share machine code across threads. Um, and then Spectre derailed that or, and, uh, and postponed it, I should say. We're working hard to feel comfortable re-enabling that. Um, and now we're working actively to uh, prototype and implement the reference types proposal, which will, as we said earlier, allow WASM to work directly with pointers to JS objects, strings, DOM objects which should really help things like Rust when they bind to the web. And I think more importantly, it paves the way to full on GC integration. So WASM point to GC objects and enabling a whole host of new GC languages. So yeah, that's that's it for me. Wonderful. And uh, DeepT and Brad, uh, you want to represent Google or Google Chrome? Um, yeah, sure. I do have some slides, mostly to remember what I should be saying. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and present my screen. OK. Um, is this visible? I'll I'm get sorry. It. I'll yeah, get it looks it. great. OK. Great. Um, so I'm going to do a quick run through on some of the things we've been working on. Um, so let's start with some Chrome feature updates. Uh, we uh, ship streaming compilation in Chrome 65. Um, so the WebAssembly API provides a function that supports uh, streaming compilation in combination with the fetch API. Uh, what this means is that the compiler can start uh, processing code as it comes, improving startup speed. So, um, you know, the compilation in Chrome 65 can keep up uh, with up to 50 Mbps download speeds on high-end machines. Um, the other exciting thing that's happened recently is that audio workloads are enabled by default in Chrome 66. Um, so what you can do with audio uh, workloads is that you can define custom audio nodes in WASM and run uh, WASM code for audio processing where you need high performance. Um, also, uh, message port now supports transferable, which allows you to transfer a WASM module over the thread boundary. So uh, this opens up a whole set of possibilities for using audio workloads. Um, you can also pass shared array buffers over message port and Chrome, but as with all things related to shared array buffers, this is still behind the flag. Um, as uh, Brad mentioned, we have a couple of other efforts that are in progress, like uh, the source maps that are going to be shipping soon. And the other thing that we're working on is getting IDB support. Um, so um, we've, we've had some questions about this. And I think uh, we've all talked about uh, interoperability with JavaScript and web APIs. Um, so again, to touch on the salient points here, for WASM to be useful on the web, we rely on support from JS and the web APIs. Um, so. I just want to highlight some efforts that are improving the general ergonomics of this interrupt. Um, so I mentioned again, I mentioned before that uh, the WeCraft proposal is, uh, you know, in stage two in TC39 now, um, and you know that gives us the ability to perform finalization on our WASM objects when the JavaScript ob object is garbage collected. Um, again, we've also talked about you know the NEREF proposal, and we've uh, made progress on implementation here. Um, so it's just basically this proposal gets host, simplifies the host bindings proposal without having to go through tables, uh, allocating slots, and maintaining index information at the boundaries. Um, the other thing that we're really excited about is that Lynn from Mozilla is championing a proposal to integrate WASM into ES modules, and uh, we're excited about implementing it. 
Um, coming to content security policies, uh, browser implementations vary as to which uh, WASM operations are allowed if there's a content security policy specified. Um, we have a pre-proposal that Eric's uh, working on that attempts to homogenize existing WASM implementations and the handling of uh, CSP. Um, in the next couple of minutes, I think I'd like to talk about some proposals that we have invested significant efforts into. Um, so this is the one I'm really excited about. The Threads proposal adds a new shared linear memory type and some new uh, operations for atomic memory accesses. Um, from the implementation perspective, we have a full set of atomic opcodes implemented for x64. Uh, we also have some toolchain support for this. So there are companies and products that are experimenting uh, with this feature behind a flag. Uh, we have sign extensions operations implemented. There's some work that's gone into implementing mutable globals and uh, specifying what bulk memory operations should look like. Again, like everybody's been talking about this, the elephant in the room is that due to recent Spectre issues, uh, shared array buffers are disabled. Um, Chrome, uh, on, and on Chrome, we're committed to having this back on the platform. Our current mitigation strategy to increase confidence in turning shared array buffers back on is to rely on site isolation. And uh, hopefully that will be shipping soon. Um, so a couple of other proposals in- The current Canada. estimate is uh, Chrome 67. Yeah. Um, so a couple of other proposals in progress, uh, we have exception um, handling. So in a web environment, exception handling can be emulated using JS exceptions, uh, which isn't very fast. So there's ongoing work to explore C++ style uh, exceptions. This is a complex area and there's a lot of uh, flux in the proposals. So we have ongoing work to have an end-to-end toolchain implementations. Um, for Fix with SIMD, we have implementations on uh, multiple architectures. In a recent community group, uh, group meeting, we presented some uh, performance benefits of including integer SIMD operations. Um, having toolchain support here will help with more work in this area. So we're coordinating uh, with Intel for adding toolchain support in the LLVM backend. Um, so to summarize, we have a lot of efforts in different areas and some uh, features prototype behind the flag. So we're excited about turning these on in the future and hopefully um, you know, get feedback and, and what's working and what's not. A couple, just to mention the couple of the odds and ends proposals, um, we, we're also actively implementing the tail call proposal. We have the multiple return proposal behind the flag. Um, we have the uh, um, we have the uh, uh, non-trapping conversion behind the flag. That's sort of, or sorry, that one's yeah, that one's behind the flag. So, so for people who are not familiar with some of these proposals, um, I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about them. Uh, so, like for example, the the SIMD thing, the fixed with SIMD. Um, does someone want to touch on why that's a proposal? Like what actually that means and what it will enable for people? Um, so it's basically vector instructions. So you have vector instructions in the hardware that uh, let you, you know, it, it's basically SIMD uh, is a full form for single instruction multiple data. So vector instructions let you operate on a lot of data at once. Um, so this is helpful for filters, for you know signal processing, uh, image processing that has a lot of data. So we're hoping that some of these applications uh, that currently run on the web, uh, having SIMD support would make these faster. Um, you know, there's some performance concerns about you know whether this is really going to be fast. Uh, you know, what is a consistent set of instructions we can have on the web? So um, there's just a lot of explorations going on about you know what we can do in that area. There's also a concerns about SIMD is not really portable. Uh, we want to set what we want to do with the proposal is define a set of portable instructions that hopefully work on most architectures. Um, a lot of what people want to do when they use SIMD is to optimize for architecture. So which is why it's kind of in um, you know it's not always in sync with portable SIMD. But we're hoping that with the set of portable intrinsics or portable operations that we define, this is somewhere we can push the gap and bring some meaningful performance. 
and, and I'd say in, in the limit, this is you know part of a, a general philosophy of, of trying to expose what the hardware can do. Um, the, the hardware has you know all all, all major architectures uh, have SIMD. They at least have one twenty eight bit SIMD. So uh, giving giving developers direct access to that seems, seems like a good good idea. There are ways you can you know try to have compilers auto auto vectorize and whatnot, but there's after you know thirty some years of trying to do that, it just just doesn't work. You you need folks to tune for it directly, and so the codex for other things is, is uh, direct access to the go. And I'm excited that our our I, I believe our colleagues have uh, at, uh, at least the two browsers represented here also have similar implementations. Uh, uh, so also at that prototype phase. Yeah, we have something for SSE. Not yet, Neon. Cool. Oh, it looks like uh, Rob Wormald from the Angular team was uh, able to just join us. Hey, Rob. Hey, everybody. Apparently, Wasm isn't going to solve my traffic problems. So. <laughs> yep. So uh, just just to give you get you up to speed, what we're currently talking about is the future features, the the things that are currently proposed, and um, that type of stuff. So feel free to jump in at any point. We're just doing a collective uh, discussion. Um, but one thing I wanted to talk about was threads. This is something I get commonly asked about is, you know, is WebAssembly finally going to give us true like P thread equivalent um, instead of needing to do the serialization like what with a, with the web workers and stuff like that. And I know it, the answer is complicated, right? Because there's separate things with the atomics and, and then a the future feature for um, the threads. But does anyone want to touch on the current thought process um, in the working group on those? I can put someone on the spot. I, I, I can I can take that. So I mean, Thanks, the, the threads proposal has has uh, you know generally uh, reached a, a, some some level of stability. I think it's uh, uh, it's not moving a whole lot at this point. And there are these uh, prototypes in, in uh, Firefox and Chrome. Uh, I think the big uh, the, the big challenge uh, there is that uh, it's uh, uh, you know obviously with uh, uh, Spectre. Uh, those unfamiliar, there's been this uh, issue uh, with uh, speculative uh, execution attacks in the hardware, and that means that uh, the uh, availability of threads is a, is a different path to providing a high precision timer, and high precision timers can be used uh, to mount those types of attacks. That's meant that we've all had to uh, look very carefully at, at our engines and, uh, uh, and, and at our browsers generally and uh, explore how to, to harden them against this category of attacks. There's, Fixes for aspects of those attacks, uh, you know, in uh, uh, in uh, firmware updates from uh, from Intel, but uh, in the limit, they don't they don't fix all of the issues, and this is, this affects all all of the architecture, not just uh, Intel as well. Uh, some ARM devices don't happen to not speculate for lower end devices, but uh, so that's a, that's a challenge in terms of uh, the rollout of the feature. I think that we all have a, a, a broad enthusiasm to. Uh, uh, to see pthreads uh, type uh, behavior as soon as possible. There are some differences in terms of uh, what the API surface looks like from pthreads. I think that, generally speaking, we'll be able to cover that up in the tools. In the limit, you might, uh, if you wanted an awful lot of threads, what we have uh, in the current proposal might uh, might have some limitations. But I think that uh, for for applications that are careful about uh, sort of using uh, thread pools and, and, and sort of keeping to the approximately the number of cores you have and all of that sort of thing. Uh, what we have is uh, looking uh, looking pretty good there. So. so as the current plan, I it's been a bit since I've looked at it. I know last the discussion I saw last was the introduction of the atomic stuff and then the expectation that um, you would defer to JavaScript to create web workers. Um, is that the current status quo of the specification? That that is that is correct. Uh, you, th this means that in terms of a pthread create, there is a little bit of a, a potential for a fun. There's a fun dance that happens uh, in the bowels of inscription to uh, pretend that you can do a pthread create. There are some situations where uh, if you're trying to create a lot of threads, you uh, if there isn't a worker spun up at the right moment, you can uh, have some uh, surprising behavior, but. For the vast majority of applications, as long as they're they, they sort of have some handle on the total number of threads they're creating, uh, the, you can make it look like the threads. 
And what's going to be the, the story long term if, let's say, I want to ship an entire WebAssembly application without any JavaScript? Like if we get access to the Web, web IDL, the actual DOM APIs directly without needing to interrupt through JavaScript, um, do you guys foresee the, the story just to be the same, that where you would still create a worker, but you're actually just creating it directly from WebAssembly instead of creating it through JavaScript? I think longer term, there was discussion of actually offering a sort of pure WASM thread, which didn't have an event loop, mm -hmm. which didn't have a GC runtime kind of by construction. And that could make the, the, the weight, you know, you know, the size and time to construct uh, these, these pure WASM threads a lot less. But that's obviously a thing that we should do with being very careful that it integrates with the rest of the lab, web platform, that what does it mean to call a web? Do, can some web APIs defined by web IDL be called from pure WASM threads under what conditions? And just there's lots of interrupt questions to ask. So it's sort of just like with everything, start with an MVP, get some stuff working, get some experience, and then, and then iterate once we have, especially the demand for improving this. I, I think, I mean, this was, this was the thing where I think some folks worried that by going down the path that we're currently on, we would, you know, end up, uh, we would, the, the sort of uh, starting energy to, to get to pure WASM threads is a little higher because obviously we'll have to justify it in terms of uh, uh, performance wins or, or, or ergonomics wins. But I think that uh, it's, it's, it seems like a thing we'll, we'll eventually want to get to. The, um, the, uh, the nice thing about the path that we're on is that it uses the services that we have. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you're trying to, uh, to do something sort of typical for a for say a game engine, you usually have a pretty good handle on uh, the set of threads that you need. So it's not a, it's not a terrible fit. Uh, to to the question of yeah, you know, pure WASM application, I think that uh, in the limit because you with the combination of any ref and host bindings, you'll be able to talk to these APIs. You'll be able to spin it up that way. I think another path to approximately the same thing is that also uh, if we end up getting uh, uh, Mod, ES6 module integration sorted out, there may be something where we, where we uh, you know, start with a very small shim or have it mean something different when you start that worker with a, a piece of code that comes down with a WASM line type. But those are all. If I yeah, it's done it. Understand right. It's has been proposed at some level to be able to make a new worker with the script being a, a module, not a, yeah. a normal top level script. Right. Yeah. And so, so, if we, we, so if you had that, yeah, yeah had plus to, that, yeah, that works together. <laughs> yeah. many, many paths to be mostly, mostly pure WASM. Although I think that that's for certainly for the monolithic app, you know, monotype situations that makes sense. I don't know that that necessarily uh, is a goal in and of itself. Um, but. Well, we had Dave asked a question about uh, how is WASM uh, sandboxed for security. I guess the short answer is it's about the same as an array buffer. You you can't access past the end of your array of bytes, and therefore it's safe in the same way JavaScript is safe. Yeah. It, this is a you know the thing where it's 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 secure secure by construction. So it's a, it's a you know we assume that the code coming out of the engine uh, is uh, doesn't violate the semantics of the uh, uh, of the WASM language, and then uh, that's been constructed in a way that you know that you're not sort of able to reach out and touch the system. Um, on our end, you know, with uh, the the heritage we have from from native client, uh, where there's a sort of the second layer of security, where there's a uh, um, a sandbox that's uh, uh, that has a validation pass. Uh, we've occasionally talked about uh, that kind of thing, but that obviously has uh, performance overhead. Uh, so we're you know, it may be a thing that we do in the limit. Uh, I, I would certainly you know. Be excited to see that happen, but especially since we're running uh, mixed in with JavaScript, uh, you know, we, we're as safe as JavaScript. Then. Yeah, yeah and, and certain and certain uh, exploits, like some of the most common ones, like buffer overflow exploits, um, like the normal one where you inject some code into linear memory and then jump to it, um, you just can't do um, in WebAssembly just from the spe the way the specification was designed is to prevent that. From now, it doesn't mean that there aren't a class of exploits. And there's a really good doc. I think it's like webassembly.org slash security or something like that. But it's on the WebAssembly org um, that explains some of those exploits and the differences and stuff like that. Um, they're all com more com much more complicated than the, the, the most simplest exploits. Um, it, it is worth pointing out that, I mean, the, the, uh, the trouble with linear memory, though, is that you're, you know, you're ultimately uh, 
you're running up against the the security of of uh, of your own uh, your own application. So if you have bugs in your if you have a buffer overrun in your C++ application, that'll you know, Wasm will happily uh, mimic that in uh, in linear memory. And, and so uh, it is something where you can't just you know you can trust that within your origin, nothing nothing is going to uh, you know creep in from outside in, in the usual sort of web pattern. But I don't think that uh, you can say you can completely ignore security because you're using assembly either. Absolutely, yeah. It's easy to defeat the, even the even the things that are put in place. It's some of them are you know relatively easy to defeat. If you fed the result of uh, of the linear memory into JavaScript and then had it create a new WebAssembly module, yeah, I mean you're <laughs> you're asking for <laughs> for trouble. I think one one place where it does help is that um, JavaScript has a bunch of uh, sort of uh, uh, foot guns in terms of. Uh, Security uh, like like eval where folks will make it extremely easy to do injection attacks, um, and I think that that's something where uh, you know it tends to be people tend to be a little more thoughtful with with uh, interop with uh, C plus But then again, you know, server side people have things all the time, so it's it's mm -hmm. it's sort of the same world. And, and now we get the fun of the injection attacks of, of all the different languages. So. Mm -hmm. Luke, did you have something you were going to say? Oh, yeah, earlier, just, and you were saying sort of the same thing. Some of the ways that you escalate and a, a native vulnerability in native code don't work on WASM, like return oriented programming doesn't work because you can't corrupt the stack. You know, you can't point, you know, jump to random positions and, you know, you, you kind of have to, you have a few, there are some points, you know, you can redirect control flow if you can corrupt a V table that's in linear memory. Well, you can jump to the wrong place if the signature matches, but it's, <laughs> it's just really, I think, uh, it's a lot harder. <laughs> Well, and, and certainly what one po one positive framing is, I mean, you've got uh, um, uh, with languages like Rust, you've got uh, the opportunity to uh, avoid uh, this, at least a subset of those kinds of issues uh, mm -hmm. uh, with your choice of language. So that's a, that's another fun option that WASM opens up. Cool. And uh, Brad asks, um, not this Brad, but uh, in our audience, uh, does the streaming compile support now in Chrome 65 bring the Chrome Wasm compile performance in line with Firefox performance? Ooh, um, putting you guys on blast. Yeah, so so I think this is a place where we, you know, we we're we're still uh, we still have not shipped our baseline tier, and so uh, insofar as a, you know, the baseline tier does make a difference, it's also the case that. Our highest end tier um, has, has a lot of flexibility, and so allows for uh, you know uh, a number of optimizations, many of which we actually don't have the compile budget to turn on. But uh, the um, uh, I would say that it, it, it brings us closer. But uh, until we have the baseline compiler, I think it's not quite apples to apples. We do have something very similar, though. It's uh, you're getting streaming compilation. You're, you, you, we were also already doing uh, parallel compilation, and so uh, it's it's in the same ballpark, but it's it's be a little better in terms of uh, that first start. So that's why we're continuing to work towards a baseline compiler. Depending on your download speed and the, how you know how large the module is, there's definitely cases where uh, you, you don't keep up with the, uh, the rate of the download. For the and uh, Jake wanted us to touch on a little bit more about uh, the interface between uh, WebAssembly objects and um, and JavaScript, like the interop, like how do you access the DOM and manipulate things? Um, does someone want to touch on, you know, for, for, I imagine a lot of our listeners, you know, don't have a lot of experience or maybe even any experience in like C, C++ and, and um, you know, those type of languages. So they're not, it's, it's hard for them to view, to fully grok and visualize what it means to be calling through two different languages, like through through WebAssembly into, into, into JavaScript. Does someone have like a really great way of elaborating that? I think it's hard even to visualize even for, for C++, you know, <laughs> well, it's, it's, uh, a lot of philosophizing in this space, but but I can talk a little bit about kind of the happy path that the Rust folks have found, which I th I'd like to see mimicked in C++, you know, different syntax, but the same concepts, which is, you know, you have a reference that come that wants to flow into to, to, to a DOM object or to a JS object that you want that wants to flow into Rust. And before we have GC integration, the fundamental limitation is, you know, WASM can only deal with integers and, and floats and, and, a, and a JS DOM a reference is neither of those. So what you do is you put it in, in an array, and then the index of that element in the array is, is what flows into Rust. And then the kind of the, 
the scoping and the stacky sort of semantics of Rust ensure that you can just push efficiently to the array and pop when things go out of scope. And then inside Rust, you can pass around the integer everywhere you want. But when it's time to actually call a method on that DOM thing, when you, because that DOM node will have a, a static type and will have a method like first child. And that means fundamentally call it to the DOM, ask for its first child, and, and give me back. When you call that method, what the bindings generator will do is call out from WASM into JS. It'll pass the integer. So JS code now can take the integer, access the array, get the reference, do the method call, get the return value, stick it in the array, get the index to that new thing, and return that back to Rust. So that's all happening under the hood. What it looks like in Rust is you just have this DOM reference. And it has a type that says, like, you know, DOM node or DOM element. And it has a static type that has the method. So you don't really see this. But what's happening is under the hood, um, these things are being stuck in arrays. And with the uh, any ref support that's now being actively worked on, that call to JS won't have to happen. You'll be able to do that, take the index, access the array, all from in, within WASM, because you'll have a table of any refs, and those that table of any refs can hold the, the references to DOM nodes. So you'll be able to pluck it out of the table and pass it to the imported DOM method directly. So that will get faster, but it's really not until we have full-on GC support that we can do kind of a whole lot better with, uh, you know, with than than that sort of basic approach. And and I mean there is a there is a crude equivalent uh, uh, in the C plus plus side uh, in bind and inscription does something similar but with lots of caveats and lots of uh, interesting quirks. So uh, uh, but but and under the hood there's similar kinds of uh, you know you can export a class and have it be visible on the outside and that sort of thing. Michael, any uh, anything to add? Uh, not really. I, I mean, uh, I think they covered it pretty well. Right. On. So um, there was someone made a comment uh, that, uh, that that this all seems so close to ActionScript and Flash. Um, so yeah, it is something I, I get I get asked a lot about when I talk about WebAssembly is like, why didn't we just use the JVM or the CLR or why didn't we just use LVM, which you know the knuckle stuff. Um, does it, do, do you guys want to touch on a little bit about that? Like, why why didn't an existing solution just get used? I think mm -hmm. a lot of this has to do with, like, a lot of the existing solutions you had till now were things that work differently in different browsers. Uh, it just, I mean, I, I think what we're doing now is working to a standardized approach, which is different from what was there previously. Um, I mean, even with Atom JSC, uh, you know, browsers had varying support to different degrees, but it was just, you couldn't guarantee consistent performance in a meaningful way. Um, based on just why not Flash or different other things, I mean, there were a lot of security guarantees that were missing, I guess. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure others could speak to this. Uh, better, but I think just like having a standardized approach, uh, in my mind, is a big win about what we're trying to do. And I will say, with with LLVM in particular, one of the one of the unfortunate experiences that, uh, that we had is that the, the LLVM folks are, are they're not really keen on their IR being uh, being sort of a, a stable uh, a stable boundary. They really would like to have the flexibility to evolve their IR over time, and so. Um, where with Pinnacle we carved out, uh, uh, you know, a, a set of passes that sort of, uh, you know, freeze it and stabilize it and all of that. That was off on a branch, um, and it's it's exciting that with WebAssembly we're not quite there yet, but we're we're very close to cutting over uh, our tool chain so that it will be in an upstream backend and you know, in some distant day, not too hopefully not too far away. You know, regular clang on your on your desktop will, will just be be able to uh, potentially produce WebAssembly code. And I think that that you know, struggling to have a stable boundary where, where the folks involved didn't want one uh, with LLVM, uh, you know, that, that was one to avoid. Flash, you know, is obviously tied to one one company's proprietary uh, thing, and uh, you know, uh, even, even uh, JDM has has shades of that as well. So. Mm -hmm. And also, there's you know, there's APIs, and that's kind of orthogonal from what's the code look like. For the code look like. We could have considered, I guess, a, a couple different things. And WASM certainly has shades of, you know, statically typed stack machines, and has, you know, a lot of ideas pulled from a lot of places. Um, but there's 
completely differently, there's all, what's the API is, are we making a second web that sits alongside the web platform? And does it share the DOM? Does it share all the web APIs? Do people have to, do developers have to choose either or? And, you know, that was kind of the world with applets and that, you know, didn't work so well. And so even if we chose to just do like say JVM or, or, or something that didn't have legal battles in flight, um, then it would have been, uh, you know, there was still been a lot of hard questions to ask about platform integration. And, and I think I think more than is uh, is obvious. Even though we we are still sort of filling in, uh, making the interop with JS nice, we we did take into account the fact that this is running in tandem with JS engines and is implemented in JS engines, and that very heavily informed uh, a lot of the design choices and uh, sort of the constraints we're operating under. So uh, other radically different sort of machine models would have been harder to shoehorn into that. Yeah, right from the beginning, we've considered the JS integration, especially like with the ES6 modules even. Our initial ABI was like just going to be uh, using an ES6 module as your WASM thing. The module support wasn't quite there in browsers yet, so we kind of had to push that back. But it, it's totally uh, a, a big goal for us to, to have this sort of support. Wonderful. Hey Rob, uh, I wanted to, to to touch on your experiences. Um, you're you're developer advocate of Angular teams, is that right? Not anymore, but yeah, <laughs> not I'm anymore. A, oh, oh, what, I've just your... changed, so now I'm a, now I'm what's called a developer programs engineer, which right. basically it's the same job with a slightly different title. So oh, we okay. we can say that I'm a developer advocate if that helps. Sure. sure. Uh, do you want to touch on? I, I you know I've I've. I've uh, hung out and talked with um, numerous members of the Angular team over the years, and you know there, we've talked about WebAssembly because of how obsessed I am with it. Um, <laughs> is there anything that you can go on record to, to talk about uh, as far as uh, possible possible solutions with WebAssembly and Angular? Um, obviously, not in the in the immediate term, but uh, something you guys are looking at. So I actually I actually wanted to ask that question to the panel, right? Um, <laughs> it's a thing that we talk about fairly often on the team, kind of in a very pie in the sky kind of way. But I think myself, like many web developers, and I think this is probably true for our team, I have a very hard time kind of in my brain grokking how I would mash these two things together, right? And I saw some of the stuff that, that the Glimmer, you know, the Ember and the Glimmer team were talking about uh, a couple weeks ago. And I think that that's, that's hugely interesting. I think that Angular, like Glimmer, like many new frameworks today, we are compiler-based, right? And so this idea of having a compiler in the middle is a comfortable thing for us. Um, and so this idea of having sort of a different target, right, is, is interesting to us. But I actually have a, a pretty hard time in my brain kind of thinking about how does WASM fit into the frameworks of today, right? And my initial kind of naive feeling is, well, it feels to me like it would be a lot like using a web worker, right? And and that doesn't seem to to capture the scope of what people are excited about. And so I guess I would turn that question back to the panel maybe and ask like, how should a framework like Angular or Ember think about the future of this, right? Should we be preparing to be replaced, which is one option, right? Should we be preparing to to integrate with these things? Should we be preparing to rewrite angular in .NET, as I got asked by somebody the other day, right? Um, which, you know, all these things are, are interesting, and I, I guess that I don't know is the answer. So I'm curious kind of how, how the panel sees this fitting into the wider, wider ecosystem, and kind of where do we go from here once all of this stuff has landed? Michael, do you think they should write, rewrite it in .NET? <laughs> oh, yeah, write everything in .NET. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this. What was it? Was it the Blazor project that came out from yeah. the Microsoft end a couple couple weeks ago? Yeah, and Michael, do you know a lot about the Blazor project? Can you elaborate? Uh, on that? Explain so that. I'm not super familiar with it. Uh, I mean, I, I've seen it and it's really cool. Uh, but I think some other people on the panel are probably more knowledgeable than me about it, like the actual specific internals of it. Mm -hmm. I just know that it was released in a preview very recently, and uh, you know their demos are very cool. Some high-level points that I know about it, um, they, because we give them linear memory and they have fundamentally to implement a GC, they include their own GC. Um, so that's one piece. Two, although they're planning and they've blogged about progress towards this, it's still an interpreter-based model, which actually has some benefits um, in, in that I think they can ship somewhat unmodified um, DLLs 
and and the interpreter kind of does the right thing. Um, and then they said be, the, about the problem of interopering with DOM, uh, I guess you don't directly touch the DOM, you do it all through, you know, there's a virtual DOM of some sort, some sort of abstraction in between them and the DOM so they can do all the dealings with the DOM on their own internal code. And the user works with .NET abstractions directly. So that I think that actually is a kind of a, a good segue into like, how, how does it, you know, what's a good way to use this in frameworks? It seems like there's two different kinds of code. One is there's this internal data structures like virtual DOMs and the, and the diff algorithms and the fibers and all the internal things that one might use inside of uh, your, your framework to, to, do the, to compute the diff, to figure out the minimal change you need to apply to the actual real DOM. And that seems like a good candidate to stick into linear memory. If these are data structures that have well-defined lifetimes, like sometimes there's a notion of tick and a, a, v, a virtual DOM you know, tree might only live one tick long, or it might have a very specific lifetime that you can say, this is when it's dead. I'm gonna release that memory. And then WASM has just very efficient options for you. You can do things like bump allocation, where when the tree is dead, you just reset the pointer and bam, you didn't have to GC or free any of that memory. And that's a cool thing you can do, but you fundamentally need to orient your use of VDOM or allocation of these things around these like bump allocators that can reset. Um, so that's one category of usage and that's to a rough approximation. <laughs> There's a lot more interesting stuff going on in Glimmer, but Glimmer's doing some of that. And I think there's some other VDOM frameworks like Elm that could that could do this pretty well. So that's for and, the dip. I mean, like that that fits right into how I think about Angular, right? Like the reason that we do templating in Angular, we've all been always been very upfront about this, is so that we can under the hood do whatever we want, right? As long as you're not directly touching the DOM, that gives us a lot of freedom. Right. And so do you do you feel that when kind of the, the DOM interop is there, that's the right kind of mental model to think about this sort of stuff in? Well, definitely for part of it. The only thing that breaks this, and it, I've seen this, I think I've seen this, you know, in some frameworks like React, which is where if references to parts of the VDOM leak out, well, all of a sudden they don't have well-defined lifetimes. And sometimes references leak out and the client, li the client code is able to stick like expandos on that object. When this happens, all of a sudden, all lifetimes that we might want to do from a bump allocator, now we have to think about how do we reflect a linear memory thing to JS, which involves lifetimes. Maybe we refs and finalizers help, but probably that's going to actually make a lot of things slower. Um, I'm, I'm very down on that whole direction. If you have a nice encapsulated data structure with encapsulated lifetimes, I think linear memory is fantastic. And so uh, that's one category. The other category is, OK, you do have things that have GC lifetimes, because that's the nature of the framework. There's the user code, obviously that's GC allocated. Sometimes it's in a language that's statically typed or has a lot of static types, or sometimes it's it's kind of the interface objects that the user code works with. Those are things that really want WASM GC. So we'll definitely want to talk to you as we start getting something in WASM GC to prototype with. But until that point in time, I think it's all about trying to find this kernel, this core algorithm that, and I think the diff algorithm is where the big opportunity is and the data structures it works on. If those have nice lifetimes, then you can, you can go nuts. <laughs> And, and just to clarify for anyone listening, if you're, we've been using the term linear memory a lot. Um, and if, if, if you're not familiar with what that, what we're meaning, I mean, like, I guess I, how I would explain it, and you guys can elaborate as well, is just that, you know, you can picture it as um, if you took CS, you know, like you're just your, 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 your uh, I don't want to keep using the word linear memory, <laughs> but uh, you know your your row of just plain old bytes. It's just binary data, and the WebAssembly engine actually knows nothing about that binary data. Um, it's all semantics to the, the compiler, the the programming language you use, like your C plus plus. It might be a struct inside of your memory, but WebAssembly itself has no knowledge of that struct. Um, so this is these are all just raw bytes. Um, which is why it can be very efficient and very flexible, but at the same time, it can get very, you know, hard for you to grok if you don't have that abstraction above it. Um, I, I did want to touch on one thing you mentioned. You mentioned uh, workers, and I think that there is uh, this, this. I don't know how to relate it to the to the, to the work you all do in, in uh, the frameworks, but uh, once we we get threads back on the platform. One sort of critical problem with workers as they're currently conceived is because they're message passing based and because of some of the properties of JavaScript, it's actually relatively expensive to send things uh, back and forth to a worker. And so that can completely undermine any advantage you get uh, from doing uh, work in the background. Uh, but with shared memory, uh, you, have the, you have at least one path to be able to do uh, uh, some very fast interactions, uh, even if you do ultimately make it look more like message passing underneath. And so, uh, 
to the extent that you can represent uh, the data that your, your framework is coping with, in that linear memory, you have an opportunity to uh, uh, to really take advantage of all the cores. And I know you all in general are sort of performance constrained, and so that's a, another. But it, I, I'm actually not sure how that how that really fits into into how you all see the world, whether it makes any kind of sense, uh, even given the, the, the performance advantages of uh, talking over that shared memory to, to say move the core of the application over to a worker or that sort of thing. I know there's been some talk of uh, uh, things like uh, 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 various proposals for uh, doing uh, DOM changeless diffing and then having that go through uh, through a shared, a shared memory, but uh, that's all kind of uh, towards that same flavor of goal. If I do the work somewhere else and then have a faster way to communicate it. Cool, and that, that actually, that resonates really well. One of the things we've had in Angular from the very beginning is very, clean separation between kind of, you know, what you call the kernel, if you like, and then kind of user land code. And it's always felt a little bit like kind of programming through a straw at the moment, right? And that's that's troublesome. And so hearing that like that's gonna be better is, is a is a positive thing for me. I mean, it, it, it's it's challenging in the sense that I don't know of any current path to if you've got JS objects that live over on on a worker, uh, the trouble is just you know, uh, except for the concurrent JS proposal, um, <laughs> there's not really a, a clear path to make it dramatically faster to uh, to have those objects uh, quickly move uh, between uh, uh, between workers and main thread or, or between workers. And so, certainly to the extent that what what your the data that you're representing could live in that linear memory, then, then there's possibilities. But it, it means that sort of has to be primarily where the data lives, which is is a big big sort of change. So Angular could potentially be using WebAssembly today and, and see improvements. I mean, obviously, we you know, you always have to profile things, but is, is that a fair statement, potentially? If you're asking me, I, I think potentially, sure. Like, I think that, that absolutely, we, we've changed how Angular works three or four times already, right? Like, completely changed the underlying implementation. Mm -hmm. So changing everything to WASM doesn't seem that massively far-fetched, right? I'm going to get a bunch of tweets later saying, oh, <laughs> man, right. um, yeah, I don't want to make you commit. I was actually more curious if the, if the, if the panel um, thinks so. I mean, obviously, you guys don't know the probably the nitty-gritty of how um, Angular actually does their diffing algorithm. But assuming it's pretty standard, I mean, there's only so many ways you can diff something. Um, it, it, it might be um, something worth looking into, or do you think that they should hold off until um, we have the, the GC stuff? I think or even once GC types are available, it will still be a win if one can manage to stick VDOMs, which are high allocation, frequently become garbage, but long enough that they become tenured. So tenured garbage, the worst type of garbage, um, to move that memory into linear memory so that you can do this kind of bump allocation. Uh, I think I have this kind of like, dream and i'm not sure who's going to realize it first but they're going to be using the entirety of wasm the the whole buffalo they're going to be using linear memory for the vdom and gc memory for all the stuff that actually has a gc lifetime and js that's the actual user code and maybe some interface aspects and they'll be using the entirety of this of this thing which will be pretty a unique uh situation the only other instance i'm aware of was a project for a while called c plus plus slash cli in microsoft and if I recall, this was C++ code that could have handles, that had a handle type that could point directly to .NET objects. Um, and, and unfortunately, I, I don't think uh, it really took off. But, uh, but anyways, it would be a really cool opportunity for a framework. If, but it, it does depend on it having these kind of design things where it can stick, where it can bump allocate memory, basically. But some interesting. We're like, we're not VDOM at all, right? We don't do the diffing at all. And so it's. Mm -hmm. The, the the allocation problem is a thing that we've actively tried to avoid doing, right? Like it's expensive mm. in, in VDOM frameworks. So we avoid doing it. Which, and then I kind of wonder, does it make sense for us at all? Interesting. Okay. Can you describe the, the way it does its change notification currently? So I would say at a super high level, we do we do data diffing rather than DOM diffing, right? So we we very much do the kind of like has your your data changed, user land data changed before we actually change DOM at all, right? So rather than where React kind of builds up a DOM, builds up the new DOM and diffs those, we skip that step or avoid that step and do data diffing, right? And obviously that constrains us. It's why we use templates, right? Templates have a, a level of static behavior that JSX or VDOM sort of doesn't. Um, and, and this is, I think, maybe where I have the trouble. And to me, like then to get the performance benefit, I have to be thinking in like, 
do my users need to be writing kind of code in Rust or .NET, right? Um, because like the framework itself, we're not dumping huge amounts of memory around, right? Well, I think um, this is where Glimmer is quite different than React also, and they don't build VDOMs. They have this yeah. static declarative language, I think, handlebars. And I think they compile that to bytecode, their mm -hmm. own bytecode, that executes in a VM that is a WASM VM. And that bytecode computes the diffs directly, so no VDOMs here, and I think new bytecode that runs to compute the next diff based on the new state of the DOM, which is pretty sophisticated. And uh, But it, it is, as you pointed out, derived from having this declarative template language. I, I think we're definitely closer to the limit model, model, and that makes sense. So. Yeah, and uh, I was hoping Yehuda would be able to join us at the last minute, but because uh, I invited him before, but he was busy with um, with EmberConf last week. Um, but yeah, you're you're right, Luke. That is that is how it works. Um, the the glimmer the glimmer stuff. So it's it's an offshoot of handlebar syntax, but it's a custom syntax. The glimmer oh. templates, um, but it's you know related. Um, so uh, what I just heard was Rob Wormald said here that Angular 7 is going to be, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I'm already tweeting. Yeah, it's already <laughs> tweeted. <laughs> oh, great. Anything else you want to add to that, Rob? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's what, one of the interesting things that I, I do keep seeing is people are pushing our app or pushing our framework further and further and further. They're building crazier and crazier and crazier things, right? And in a lot of cases, we feel like we are reaching the headroom of what the browser has. So this new kind of avenue of actually we have a whole nother level of performance we can get to is something that gives me some comfort looking at the next five years, what I'm going to be doing in my job, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think while we don't know all the answers yet, it's something that I think we find very, very exciting. And I think we're super excited that, that y'all are doing all this work to you know give us the next level to, to work on to. So. Yeah, it, it's very exciting, even if I don't have my whole brain wrapped around it yet, right? And, and the Blazor project, when I saw that, I went, ah, OK, because I've always been quite quite skeptical, right? And I have this, like, well, it's just going to be a better web worker. Um, but but seeing Blazor, that kind of reset my brain a little bit. And I went, OK, maybe I should maybe I should think a little differently about this. So, Do you know, are they still doing uh, Angular Dart? Angular Dart mm -hmm. still Angular Dart still thing. Is, and is that an actual fork? Like, do you guys maintain two separate repos, or does it somehow? <laughs> So they were originally the same code base. And we, because we're insane sometimes, we wrote a uh, TypeScript to Dart transpiler, oh, wow. which had Ooh. its own set of, of fun things to deal with. So you know, writing a transpiler from one language to another is not that crazy as an idea for us, right? Um, but I, I guess about a year and a half ago, we did fork into two totally distinct frameworks at this point, because we found that that was a real nightmare to, to try and manage two languages and get the semantics right for both. Mm -hmm. um, but the Dart so project I, is interesting, right? So, so and, and I could see like a, a, a Angular Wasm kind of in the same vein as, as Angular Dart, right? It's the, it's the same set of templating syntax, the same set of semantics, the same sort of mental model, right? So you can kind of maybe potentially write Angular Rust or Angular .NET. I'm going to get in trouble for saying Angular .NET again, <laughs> um, you know. But like that kind of model where like it's not the same framework, but it's the same language. It's just the same kind of semantics. Everything's the same, but just a whole copy of the framework almost. Yeah, it seems like it seems like when we get GC GC and host bindings and all that sugar that it really doesn't matter too much what language Angular itself was written in and you know like it'll be able to interrupt fairly naturally um, it sounds like with you know if you wanted to continue to write your your Angular in JavaScript or you could write your Angular in in Dart or Reason or whatever language you want. Um, that uh, it's interesting possibilities. Uh, we're a little far away from that, but it, it's it's nice to dream. Uh, I think this is one of the one of the reasons that the uh, ES six module support is, is going to be very interesting to see how that unfolds because that'll be that might be the the, the sort of integration point where it's like oh I've got a little blob of Wasm that was written in Rust and then I import that and it imports some piece of JS and that that multi language world is going to be challenging and interesting. Does anyone know if Dart actually has plans to target WebAssembly with when GC arrives? Or? We, we have had conversations with uh, with them. I think they're definitely uh, somebody we want to take into account with the uh, as we, as uh, progress happens with the most managed languages um, with this, with the managed objects. I think the um, the uh, they're 
uh, they're in the midst of uh, having uh, come out with sort of a, there's a dark version too that has some slightly different uh, assumptions about uh, how how much knowledge is there statically, and so that will uh, play into uh, uh, what that ends up looking like. But they're, they're definitely interested. Cool. Uh, there was a question from our listeners of how does WebAssembly integrate with Node? Um, they're assuming there's some sort of overlap since Node runs on the V8. Um, I can speak to this a little bit. Um, so I, I think uh, so. We um, Node Eight uses you know we've had WebAssembly support since Node Eight, and because Node is built on V8, you kind of um, get this for free. Um, I don't necessarily know about all of uh, the interop cases, but I can definitely see benefits. Like uh, say you know you can split them up into client side and server side. So a way to think of this is, uh, you know, if you have compression, uh, image compression or filters or language detection, any kind of high performance things, that's maybe more you can do on the client side instead of having to send it over to the server and have this um, computation be performed. Um, on the server side, I don't necessarily think that WASM gives you a lot of performance benefits. But it also, um, you know, there's other ways to think of this in the sense that I know that the people I've talked to at, on the node end have uh, talked about just pain with, you know, being able to support different platforms, um, maybe shipping a portable binary that will work on a subset, at least of their platforms, addresses some of this pain and, you know, you're willing to trade some performance for that. So um, there's definitely a lot of potential for interop, I think. Yeah, the, the, the Node folks have kind of an interesting uh, um, problem in that they, on the one hand, for everything that's written in JS, they, they have a really nice uh, distribution story. And then when you have native modules, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, they've, they've got all kinds of uh, ABI, API compatibility issues in terms of uh, this distribution. And for places where WASM, you know, something could, is just pure computation, it plugs in really nicely. I, there's, I've talked to at least a few folks over, over here that, uh, are interested in sort of could we use it in that uh, you know in that uh, space where it sort of starts to interact uh, with the native system? There, you know, once you once you uh, remove uh, running untrusted code from the picture and you assume everything's trusted, there are some possibilities, but there's also sort of challenges to uh, you know WASM is uh, is 32 bit, and if you're interacting with the native system, 64 bit, and so there's interesting uh, FFI interop questions there. Um, there's some possibilities that, that, that could be made nicer, but uh, yeah, native native modules in Node are, 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 are just a it's, a, it's a distribution and packaging challenge, and WASM maybe can help in the limit, but it'll, it'll be, there's lots to have. It'll have to happen. To make that really speaking, speaking of which, what's the current status of 64-bit uh, WASM? I think we've assumed it, that at some point we'll have a, 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 a version of the uh, the loads and stores that will take a 64-bit index. I think that's, that's been kind of there's a few other ideas that bounced around just in Google around uh, other other kinds of uh, ways you could have a memory model that uh, might one of the, one of the things that we're getting out of being 32-bit now and 64-bit uh, systems is that we're able to. Uh, 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 use uh, use memory tricks to uh, make bounce checks cheaper, and that would we would lose that if we went to to sixty four bit. Um, but and so there have been some ideas around you know ways you preserve that those properties. But I think the more likely situation is that at some point we say you know, okay, we're going to add some, a version of loads and stores that uh, make a sixty four bit index. It's um, just not so, on the docket right now. Uh, it's not currently on the docket. I think it's a there's sort of the, uh, one of the, one of the challenges is that that would almost certainly lead to applications that would leave behind uh, a chunk of the web. Right now, there are still a sizable number of 32-bit systems, and um, even though WASM is is uh, you know, theoretically with 32-bits, we could support up to four gigs. Uh, I believe all of the browsers uh, still cap the memory at two gigs, uh, just just because that was the limit that was there for sure to or for array buffers. So I think I think we would probably at the point that we feel the pressure to uh, to go up to four gigs, that would be the time to start talking about what happens after that. But I do, I do think it's something we should probably start to start to talk about. It, it wouldn't be a huge deal, I imagine, if it should be used to put it as uh, It would be a breaking change if we kind of a strange aspect to it. 
probably, I mean, probably breaking. It wouldn't break old co existing code. It would just mm -hmm. allow new code to run. Right, right. Is, uh, the, is the thought process that we would do some sort of uh, thirty like sixty four bit emulation on thirty two bit platforms, or that it just would be it does not work? It would be so very slow because every <laughs> single pointer, every single load, <laughs> right? yeah. Maybe yeah. there's a, a, a smart trick to 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 let sixty four bit mm -hmm. code run. The problem is, yeah, it's when you think of those tricks, there's ways to break them. So, because one thing I imagine is there'll be there'll be a class. Maybe not. Maybe tooling will maybe tooling will prevent this. But I just imagine that there'd be a class of people who, for whatever reason, do compile down to sixty four bit in, environment, even though they don't need it. You know, they think they need it for you know memory size, or they don't realize that you can't have like in the 32-bit system you can have 64-bit integers. It's we're you know we're just talking about the, the linear memory, um, you know for for whatever reason. Because I like I've had like I didn't I was talking to someone at a conference um, a year and a half ago about this, and that the I didn't realize until about 20 minutes into the conversation with that person that that was the misunderstanding that they that they thought that we were we were waiting on the ability to use 64-bit integers, and so. Um, it's possible. I, mean, I think it's ultimately going to come down to tooling. You know, making that not um, you know an issue. For people. What I think might press it to happen sooner, if it, if it does happen sooner, is is we do actually we do have some applications that are starting to show up where not for every use case on the web do they care about that size, but for sort of the long tail of their use cases. For example, we we have uh, uh, Google Earth uh, coming to, to WebAssembly soon. Well, for the you know, sort of the mainline version of that, uh, it, it's certainly the case that you, you're fine with, uh, with a 32-bit address space. Um, they have uh, sort of an ecosystem of plugins for their for their historical product, where you can add overlays for uh, various uh, various kinds of uh, uh, research applications. And in that case, you know, you've got uh, potentially very large data sets that uh, would run out of space. Or uh, similarly, at least some of the media folks that I've talked to. You know, for the average case, sure, two gigs is fine. But if you want to be able to import all of the things that your your desktop desktop version of the product can import, then you'll, you'll want more memory. So it might be something where if we had tooling support to build in both modes, and you have a deployment and you detect as long, it, it, I think it would be something where we have to watch out for this sort of hazard of, uh, uh, as you say, folks uh, only building for the for, for the, uh, the higher end systems. And, uh, and this is a general thing with Lasm, right? This is consideration with SIMD where we you know we can say, oh well only you know we'll support two fifty six bit SIMD, but then uh, what happens on systems that don't have that. So there's a question about uh, when liftoff, the, the WebAssembly baseline compiler for V eight, when will that be released? Uh, we're we're aspiring for it to be uh, this quarter for for X sixty four. We have a lot of arches that uh, the V eight supports, and in, in the limit, we even support like S three ninety. So uh, <laughs> the uh, I, I don't I don't think we'll have all the arches from from day one, but uh, the uh, uh, for for X sixty four, we're hoping for uh, very nice. And uh, also, is the Balder Monkey already shipped in Firefox? Oh yes, yes for a, a year, a year now. Oh, wonderful! Uh, what's the? I'm actually curious. So it's it's hard to, and you may not know the answer to this, Luke. But um, so I've you know seen and heard a lot about Servo and all these other you know the 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 efforts to have Firefox use more and more Rust based stuff. But it's you know rewriting all of Firefox is would be just an impossible challenge right away. Um, so. Where is the where are the lines right now with uh, quantum? Is that what was that what the the latest version was called? That the... Yeah, that was that was a big release in November. The name right. we, we kind of named a version, <laughs> made a yeah. lot of noise around it. But that version was, I think, the first that shipped a major component of Servo, which was this the parallel style system. Mm -hmm. So that that pulled a bunch of Rust code into into so, Firefox. So the current WebAssembly stuff is that C plus plus or Rust? We we've currently yeah we've implemented that in in C plus plus. So. All, at the moment, all of Spider Monkey is, is C plus plus, and there are no uh, immediate plans to to go to, to Rust. There's some ideas and, uh, and some prototypes, but uh, but at the moment, it's not 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 in the next few, not in the next quarter or anything. Mm -hmm. Cool. I don't know. Um, 
So in case it's, uh, I don't think I've missed any questions. If I have missed your question, feel free to, to repost it. Um, uh, moving on a little bit, uh, tail calls. So this is something that I know that the, the TC39 has been talking about revisiting as far as the JavaScript side of, because they have the implicit tail calls, but they're talking about revisiting with more explicit ones because none of the vendors, um, except for Safari, I think, um, ended up actually implementing it. Um, uh, I think on the WebAssembly side, tail calls is not really going to be a huge controversial thing, right? Because this is a, you know, mostly a, a compiler thing, like you know, the compiler decides whether to do so or not. Um, do, you, do you guys disagree, or do you have a different take on it? Well, it, I believe Michael stepped away briefly, but uh, yeah. and he'd be a good one to bring into this conversation. But uh, um, one of the challenges we, we had, we had some of the same kinds of issues that arose in the JS space come up with WebAssembly. I think we, uh, I think we've managed to work past them. Uh, the, uh, is it the debugging stack stuff, or there's there's two there's two issues. One uh, one is there's there's a question of what it looks like in the debugger and uh, there's sort of a different set of expectations around JS that I think uh, uh, inform that. The other challenge is that uh, for specific to, to uh, Edge and Microsoft, uh, and actually Michael, did you want to speak to the to the challenges of uh, uh, of uh, the, uh, the uh, x64 uh, Windows okay. calling convention and structured exception handling and all of that? Uh, sure, sure. Um... Yeah, I mean, for uh, Windows, we have a <laughs> pretty... tail call, by the way. This is what where this came Oh, up. for tail call. Okay, yeah. So uh, for x64, we have... Uh, we basically use the Windows x64 ABI. And this kind of mandates that you have fixed size frames. Uh, and with tail call, you might need to uh, grow your frames if you have more arguments, for example, uh, than, than the caller had. Um, and that kind of breaks the ABI where you'll have to, you know, maybe remove the return address on the stack or something. Um, we have had some thoughts about how we could get this to work, where uh, you can introduce some intermediate frames, uh, which would basically, anytime you need more space on your stack, you would, you would add an extra frame on your stack that would be hidden, and it would just have the space for your new arguments. Uh, we we haven't actually implemented this yet, but it seems like uh, it's something that is theoretically possible, just uh, kind of ugly. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, I think with tail calls mostly, you can make them work, but sometimes it comes at a performance cost and. And the question, and our main interest is making sure that normal calls don't get slower just because of the existence or possibility of tail calls. And so that involves actually just uh, some sort of subtle semantic detail about details about how we validate WASM. Do we let, you know, do we let things that didn't do a, a call site that didn't do a tail call do it, or a function, does a function know if it can be tail called or not? That type of thing. Um, and that influences how you compile it and how efficient you can be. So that's, but it's, I think these details are somewhat smaller than, uh, than the one that then the issues that were you know being hashed out in the in the JS committee. Mm -hmm. So now we're we're uh, wrapping up the the conversation. I wanted to talk a little bit more, little more pipe dreams. Um, super far. Feel free to talk, think super far in the future, five, ten years, that type of thing. Uh, what what do you all see WebAssembly doing for web applications and and applications in general? Like there's there's talk um, and speculation and desire for WebAssembly to become more than just uh, a way to program to ship you know, applications to your browser or something like that. Something something more fundamental. For example, um, you know, like an operating system supporting WebAssembly more first class, basically blending the the ideas and the goals of like a progressive web app type of thing, but instead having a more native experience, um, you know, like because Android, iOS, all of these platforms, they all have their own proprietary sandboxing model, um, and also their own their own uh, you know, actual binary interface. So the if if we were able to consolidate all around WebAssembly, it wouldn't get us all the way there because they're all you know like it seems like it's an impossibility to to get browser or different. Uh, 
operating systems to agree on like a UI kit, the same UI kits and stuff like that. Like those are, and even low level APIs are almost impossible too. But it would get us a lot of the way there for tooling, um, tooling reuse and, and mindset as well, and help blend the two platforms, the web and, and native together. Um, have you guys, it's, it's early on this type of speculation, but have, do you guys have any thoughts on, on that? Lots of thoughts. <laughs> Ooh, let's hear it. Oh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> to not to just to say a few, like one you're getting at WASM being used outside of a web context. And as soon as you do that, then the question is, well, what can it call? What can it import? And then that already I've heard rumblings in multiple places of people talking about, could we define a portable set of imports that could abstract over operating systems, allow a single WASM to run in to be more portable than, than you can do today with binaries while still getting you know high performance. And maybe those things could also still be mapped to the web. So this would in some ways be increasing the reach of the web. Uh, and and that, I, that I see being uh, a really cool thing is if there was less of a, of a cliff between I'm making a web app that runs in a web browser and I'm making a native app and has high performance and, it's, and all this stuff in it, but it doesn't run portably and I'm, and, and I'm locked into one particular uh, garden. So trying to uh, make there be less of a cliff where you can just make an app and by default, maybe if the tooling's really good, you, you're by default, it can run on the web and off the web. And then just as people do specialize their app to, oh, when I'm on this, I, I take advantage of these features. And when I'm on iOS, I do this. And when I'm on Windows, I do this. Well, then when I'm on the web, I have ex ex access to some extra JS code and I can do some other interesting things here, but uh, apps could be a little more kind of universal than they are now. And, and maybe the web ends up you know, and the DOM ends up being that um, UI abstraction that, you know, uh, gets used in more places, which is already, I guess, a trend we see with like hybrid web apps and, you know, your uh, uh, electron I, I, things. I, I do I do think it's it's one of these things where the, the um, you know, naturally when you have a, a portable format, people start talking about where are the other places you can use it. I think one very good decision that, that uh, we, we ended up making in that space is that uh, we we did keep the core very small, and and we, you know, you can have a you can have that forty byte WebAssembly module that that sort of the thing, and that uh, that means that, that there isn't a a huge set of assumptions about where it's running, and there are already uh, you know some uh, folks that participate in WASM CG who are trying to run WebAssembly in other contexts, uh, uh, and so I think that that, that uh, well well we you know are going to be uh, you know, having this goal of a, a sort of a universal thing requires uh, that you do figure out that problem of what are the APIs. Uh, the nice thing is that we've, we've, we've layered it, and so there's, there's the opportunity to, to sort that out uh, uh, independent of the core, where in some language, some language runtime slash portable formats, uh, those things are all intermittently intertwined. And on uh, and Michael, I, I know Windows has that uh, universal Windows platform. I think it's called um, format for shipping apps using JavaScript and stuff like that. Um, is that I actually haven't looked in. Does that support WebAssembly, or do you, do they have plans to support WebAssembly? Uh, so it should support WebAssembly uh, currently, um, but just you know, Chakra supports WebAssembly, and so so the they don't explicitly those apps will automatically just get that. Um, we haven't done any special work for it uh, yet, but you know we we've definitely heard interest from people uh, working on UWPs that like WebAssembly will will be useful for them. And I I mean I'm not sure exactly how useful because it's not as portable a target as uh, you know you're going to be porting to phones and everything else. Like for Windows, it's mostly uh, you know x86, x64, mm -hmm. and a little bit of ARM. So, yeah. But it, it could help you reuse uh, code between platforms that other than Windows, you know, like if you were, yeah. if you, if you were wanting to you know, share code between like target, um, you know, it gets us basically, what, I, what I'm trying, what I'd like is for one of the vendors like Microsoft or Google or what have you to, one of the browser vendors to take a more active stance in trying to experiment with WebAssembly more natively because uh, you know basically it it's it, it always takes you know it's it's a very incremental thing right so so there's if a browser excuse me if a operating system vendor takes that step and makes WebAssembly more first class it still is not the perfect world because the other brow the other operating systems don't do it right so it's like 
not it's not really that 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 perfect world. But I think we need to to take those steps and experiment, and um, at least get some some feedback on whether this is a viable thing. Like the Chrome OS stuff, I think is super useful in in that same vein. It's it's provided I think a lot of inspiration and ideas and knowing what works, what doesn't work, those type of things. Um, and and presumably you could use WebAssembly on Chrome OS. I mean, I don't. See I was going to ask that question. That was going to be my yes, that yes. question. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 yeah. yeah, but there's no, there, there's not currently anything special about that. You know, it's just a normal, uh, the normal JavaScript VM, right? There's nothing exposed special to to WebAssembly. Yeah. yeah. The um, one one of the the hurdles I think we'll have to, to because we kept that core very small uh, in terms of having. Uh, portability and, and, and whatnot is that uh, right now, uh, although in principle we support shared libraries, uh, we don't have a stable ADI at the, at the even the C level. We don't have uh, sort of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a pattern to do this, to do shared libraries and description, but, but it's sort of uh, string and glue and, and very hacky. We're, we're actually here at Google kind of maybe put some of those into that uh, next quarter. But the, the challenge is that uh, you know, she's got an application that reuses large lumps of something, you know, some sort of a runtime for uh, for interop. Uh, right now, you'd have to embed that in each application. It's, uh, something I think that we'll, we'll want to get sorted out. We're, we're going to have uh, you know standard lumps of stuff that, that folks will want to reuse, and, and have the, having those be forward and backward compatible. I think is going to be important. Is there is there a, this is a question I'm asking is there has there been any discussion about trying to make dynamically linking of libraries more first so I guess let me give you the use case to make it make sense so let's say that I want to include some virtual machine and like that's com I have a a virtual machine that was compiled down to WebAssembly I want to run VirtualBox in the browser or something you know like it doesn't matter what it is and I want let's say that this this virtual machine becomes popular, and a lot of browsers use it. It's like the you know the jQuery or whatever. Um, you know, al although we can all share from a CDN the actual um, you know files themselves, the actual compiled code I could store in IndexedDB, but I can't share that compiled code across domains. Um, so we've talked we talked about a variety of things in this space. Um, one sort of hack that can be done, obviously, is we could do uh, content-based caching that we could do by DB. That's probably not not the desirable form of the limit. Um, with the streaming API, there's the possibility that uh, the browser can be much smarter about recognizing, oh, you both downloaded this from the CDN and had the browser line type that goes in the cache. Let me just put that out of the browser cache. And unlike JavaScript, where, where we're, we're at least not able to cache uh, optimized code, uh, with WebAssembly, there's no reason you couldn't cache the optimized version. There's a um, one, one uh, Use case I, I do worry about is that that uh, sort of a large uh, game runtime, so like Unity, if they wanted to ship that as a uh, a shared library, they have sort of an update uh, challenge because what you what you really want to be able to do is uh, you know, use the old version until the new version is ready and trigger that. One thing Luke and I have talked about is there's this uh, cache call uh, revalidate uh, header that was a proposal and then we shipped it and then shipped it with a bunch of background and that might be one uh, possible a fairly small hook to, to give a hint to the browser that okay I've got this new version of the, the, the library go ahead and download that compile that in the background uh, when it's ready the next time you, you come across that app use the new one so it's certainly something we've, we've thought about cool did, did I did I get that roughly no oh, yeah that, that yeah, answers my question and yeah. um, what, what I gathered, uh, there's just uh, none of the browser vendors are currently supported. That streaming stuff you're talking about, um, they currently support the streaming API, but they don't do the caching of the actual. Correct. Uh, unfortunately, the, a lot of the caching layers, at least in Chrome, um, have a lot of sort of JavaScript centric assumptions that give them sort of what you what you can you know the most currently you can cache the uh, uh, you can cache the admission by code, uh, and that that saves you parse time and, and all of that, but compared to, uh, you know, the, the time that it takes to optimize. Mm -hmm. Cool. That is a thing I'm, we're, we're interested in doing also, is, is storing compiled WASM machine code in the HTTP cache. And it's something we're doing similarly for JavaScript at the moment, is caching, yeah, bytecodes and descriptions of where, where functions are and, you know, 
all that type of thing. So plugging into that for WASM would be pretty natural. It, it's one of these things where this is a good example of something where WASM does have have this nice advantage that because it uh, because it doesn't have the, the the sort of tier up and tier down uh, property to it, you, you have a lot lot of uh, uh, opportunities to, to do a really good job of uh, of caching and maybe even caching cross cross browser updates and things like that that you wouldn't dream of doing with, with, with the JavaScript space. Very cool. Uh, and Brad Morris asks the timeline for IndexedDB support, uh, cache support in Chrome. Uh, Q, Q2, Q2. Uh, we're, we're, we've had various, we've had the feature available behind a flag for, for quite some time, actually, practically since, uh, actually since we, since we launched WASM. Um, the issue is that we haven't rolled it out because we're, we're not confident that we'll uh, be able to uh, offer it in a form that both handles very large modules and also uh, is uh, stable across database upgrades. We don't want to pry your data, your uh, your index DB under under the covers if you uh, if there were certain kinds of changes. And so we've been looking through those issues, and it's unfortunately taken a little longer than we originally planned. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, Brad's follow up was that uh, he's hearing from us that index DB is not the end game for for the Wasm caching strategy. Um, is that a fair statement to say, or would you say? Like to me, it seems like it's just it's it's for different use cases. It's going to be you know one tool you can use for a specific use case. It feels I would, like the power tool. Yeah, but it, it seems like for the common, I made a small little wasm, and I'm not really thinking about like caching a whole game that's updating itself with a whole life cycle. It seems for just that I just made a small wasm. You kind of want the implicit thing just to to get your back and just make you a little faster. Yeah, this is this is the thing that we, there was a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, sort of crashing around that went around in the space because but one of the the, the things with uh, um, uh, WebAssembly code is it can be quite large. You know, there are folks that are bringing over applications that were you know big even on native systems that had some noticeable download time. And for uh, if you've downloaded two hundred megs of code, you probably don't want to compile that too many different times if you can avoid it. And so uh, where the, the sort of natural model of the web is that you you, know, you, you try to cache it if you can, and, and, and you know, in the limit you just uh, you, you recompile or you re-download. Uh, that that really doesn't work if the, if the applications get big enough. And so we, we did the IDB thing because we really wanted uh, for those large applications for them to have a, a very strong and ambiguous signal to indicate, hey, please keep this around. Don't don't compile it the second time. That makes total sense. Uh, did I did I miss anyone's questions? If I missed your question, now would be a great time to repost it. Any anything uh, anyone else wants to to talk about? Uh, get their two cents in, or their uh, do some some speculation about what might happen in in, in the super future of WebAssembly. So, so one thing I hadn't really thought about, and I've always kind of thought about WASM in the browser context, right? And we were mentioning earlier a little bit, sort of WASM and Node, and how those two things fit together. Does it make sense that things like the SAS compiler, which today is written in C++ and or Dart or Ruby, there are about three or four different versions out there at the moment. That's a thing that tends to cause all kinds of cross-platform issues for us. Is that the sort of thing that we, we see being like, I would ship my SAS compiler as a WASM module to run in Node? And then at the end of that speculation comes like, are we gonna write Webpack in something like Rust and use that to build JavaScript, right? Because um, the one thing that we hit on Angular today, on especially on large enterprise applications, is we can do things pretty quickly in the browser. You know, we can deal with networks, but build tooling is a big challenge for us. And having uh, you know performant turnaround times on things like TypeScript compilers and SAS compilers and all of these things, it's a bit of a nightmare at the moment. Um, and do we see WebAssembly being part of that story eventually? Like, will there be a WebAssembly pack? I think well, there's there's actually a PR for libs. Oh, sorry, Lou. Oh, the, there's okay. always that delay. <laughs> the, uh, Lib SAS. There's actually a PR. It's funny you mentioned that. Uh, OJ Kwan created a, a pull request to to do that to, to compile oh, Lib SAS to WebAssembly. There's some issues with it, so I don't know if it's going to get merged. But he did it more of just like wanting to to learn more about the tooling and WebAssembly in general and see what was possible. Um, to me, that seems like a natural thing um, mm -hmm. because. I'd be, although WebAssembly is not Im immune to security things, I would be less concerned about letting someone um, bring their own binary onto my machine, um, you know, and um, I think it would be natural. 
um, and dealing with the portability issues as well. It would be able to run on a lot more. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I haven't heard a lot of in the Node community of what their long-term plan is. I think to me, it seems like it would be natural to try and phase out their their native API. Um, I think it probably makes sense to keep it just because at the end of the day, there'll be things that you'll want to do um, in that you just can't do, exposing certain things and stuff like that. Um, but I think leaning on WebAssembly for a majority of the things, or maybe it means even exposing like having like you can't write your entire application in, in native code, but you could you can expose certain bindings somehow to WebAssembly or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure if there's been discussion on this. I mean, I imagine there'd be there's been informal discussion. I, I mean, I spent I spent six hours dealing with polyfills for Internet Explorer yesterday, right? So my <laughs> my like, things that are happening in the browser soon that's that's a lot further out in my world right but in terms of like developers using build tooling using node that's generally you can move to newer stuff much much quicker right and so yeah. maybe that's what, that avenue for uptake luke luke what uh, what were you going to oh, yeah. well yeah we were talking to some node people who are feeling all this pain and communicating it and it what's neat is it seems like there's a very fast path that is today which is just compiles code to wasm and then wrap it in a JS wrapper, and then you can do it as just a plain old package, no special. And this is only for these kind of pure applications that don't need to call into the OS, that don't need to call into core node. It seems to do better. A, there needs to be some extra imports that might get exposed. You know, one way is to thunk through JS. So even technically that is available to WASM and that it can call JS, who can call and get a thing. But I think there's extra APIs that are available to, to, to native node modules. And so it, it would be an interesting decision if they chose to dis to expose like a stable ABI that you could write a native node WASM module. Um, and then there's some other challenges too, like I think there's both a JS event loop and a C++ event loop. And WASM can't get onto that C++ event loop by default today, but maybe with extensions, you know, you can run WASM on that C++ event loop, which would allow you to run and par get the parallelism benefits and stuff like that. So if they chose to, take it seriously, I think that there, there does seem like there's a big opportunity there for reducing a lot of that native module pain. And, and there's actually an opportunity at some of these big companies who want to ship, like, like if you, like, I'm not going to name any, put any companies on blast or anything, but the, if you wanted to ship, you know, you wanted to write some applications in Rust or something like that, and you wanted to deploy those web applications, um, you know, you, right now you have to worry about what the actual architecture that it runs on. You have to compile for that architecture. But if you, you know, want to do some sort of platform as a service or, or you want their, your app developers not to have to worry about that, WebAssembly seems like a really great target. And it helps with the, uh, you know, it adds that one layer of extra security um, in case you do screw something up as as a developer, which we all do, right? So I mean, it seems like I don't I don't know anyone who's actually doing this in production, doing that in product in production today. But it seems to me like that would be a very attractive solution um, when you might otherwise reach for something like Java. Um, obviously, there's it, if that ever becomes something that's popular to do it that way, um, that's going to be a while just because you know people have invested so much in things like Java, and Java works really well. For what it you know what it's intended to do. So in, in the conversations I've had with Node folks, one one other challenge is that there's been a lot of investment for particular ports to do all of the build plumbing and the interop, and very often they're, they're sort of per OS and they have uh, you know if it's something like you're talking to a SQL database over you know uh, over over Dbus, then you've got you've got all kinds of fun uh, to actually have all of that work in tandem. But it, in the limit, absolutely, it seems like a thing that we want to make important. And then I had, I had a, sorry, I had a quick question also. Just who uh, in Node is are the people that are actually working on this? Are there any specific names that we can go Node people can go ping? Who do we complain to? Is that what you're <laughs> yeah, Yes. Well, who we who who we can ping, but maybe that too. I don't know anyone myself. I, I could, there's some folks on our end that I might be able to get you in touch with, but I'm not going to be to be able to bring, bring that to you offline. Sure. Uh, so one thing that, I, that uh, has been asked is like, better t uh, about to us to talk briefly, we don't have a lot of time, but talk briefly about um, uh, the, the web community tooling, things like Webpack. Um, you know, I, I know we don't have uh, the Webpack team on here to touch on it, 
Um, but uh, I know you guys have been working fairly closely with them um, to improve the, the interop story on that. Um, is, that, is that how you, is that all the panelists, do you guys agree that that's probably how a lot of majority of people who are listening are going to end up using WebAssembly is, is through something like Webpack? I think it makes sense to, at least especially for now, think of it like, you know, JS modules import WASM, WASM imports JS modules, and the bundlers turn that into reality by issuing the ultimate underlying JS API calls. Because the JS API that we have today for WASM is pretty low level, pretty, um, pretty hard to use, and thinking about things in terms of like modules and imports is, I think, much nicer, especially when you have uh, wrappers that can do nice things like coercing strings in and out and all that stuff. So I think that is going to be, or it's not today the case because uh, like mscript and emits its own thing, and then the way you work with that is its is its own story. Um, but what I'd like to see more migration to is is emitting is kind of an ES mo module centric kind of worldview of we emit modules and they participate in a bigger module graph, and you know they get packaged in npm as, as you know as packages containing modules, and then the way you use it is you install it and then import a module, and and that whole sort of story develops. Cool. All right. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap up unless anyone has any final closing thoughts. Cool. Well, I really appreciate you all joining me today. It was wonderful meeting all of you. And uh, if you guys have any questions, where can we all find you on the internets, on Twitter or GitHub or whatnot? Um, where do you prefer to be found? Brad? Uh, folks can reach out to me, Brad Nelson at Google. I think that's probably the most likely to actually get a response. <laughs> yeah. Deep Deep? Um, I think a GitHub message, or I have, uh, I, I've tried to make some progress in keeping it an active Twitter account, so that might work in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Luke? I'm pretty quiet on Twitter. Uh, Luke at email, Luke at Mozilla.com email would be uh, better, I think. Cool. And Michael? Uh, probably GitHub, uh, Mike Holman. Be good. I'm seeing a trend here. Not a big, not a lot of Twitter fans here. <laughs> Rob, I know you're you're a, you're a much bigger fan of Twitter, right? Well, one of the benefits of having a really weird last name is that you can register the same handle everywhere. So it's Rob Warmald at Google at GitHub at Twitter. It's all the same, and I I I'm most active on Twitter probably. So mm -hmm. yeah, like likewise for me. I mean, I'm but I'm underscore J Phelps underscore J A Y. Um, so if you follow the regular Jay Phelps, you're going to get uh, football and basketball tweets and stuff like that. So, Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining me. And I uh, hope you all join us next time for this.javascript. And this was uh, a really great, uh, really great uh, podcast. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks for hosting. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>